Hello, my name is Shanil Lal and I'm not drunk, but the doctor who delivered me was. Uh, on the 22nd of January 2000, my doctor delivered a gay mistake. Me, I was that gay mistake, but I'm a huge fan of Lady Gaga, so I like to think of my birth as a remake of A Star Is Born. I came out my mom with a pride flag in one hand and my own vocabulary in the other. Oh yes, my own vocabulary, which has words like spill the tea, hunty, or oh, grrr, and many other profanities that we can't go over because we have minors in the room. <laughs> Since early childhood, there has been a lot of conversation around what caused my homosexuality. My mom has a rather funny explanation. She thinks that growing up, I watched too much of the soap opera Indian drama TV shows where they slap you once, but you get hit six times. <laughs> well, apparently it made me gay. So grateful, thank you, India. <laughs> In 2017, I was volunteering at the Middlemore Hospital when a church leader came up to me and he said he wanted to pray. I was hoping he would pray away the carbon emissions, but uh, he wanted to pray my gay away. He said it was a disease that needed to be cured or it would kill me. But I just happened to know that not a single death certificate in the world says this person died of the disease homosexuality. And sadly for him, I'm still alive. <laughs> I got 99 problems and being gay is just one of them. <laughs> uh, I'm a person of color, I'm an immigrant, I'm gay, I support the Green Party. Yeah, so if there was an oppressions Olympics, I would win the gold medal. Uh, speaking of being oppressed, another suggestion that was made was that uh, I have some sort of childhood trauma that made me gay. Now I agree with this one, I do have some childhood trauma. But how do I say this without sending white policemen to my ancestors' graveyard? What's known as high quality and uh, robust discipline in the islands is frowned upon in New Zealand. That's not true, it is illegal. <laughs> uh, I was born in Fiji and so were my parents, but we managed to live in two completely separate bubbles. They grew up in a time when diversity wasn't celebrated and change wasn't welcomed, so my house was never the place for controversial topics. Even climate change was too spicy. Mm -hmm. I'd say to my mom, the sea levels are rising, and she'd say, it rained last night, what do you expect? <laughs> so I knew my sexuality was gonna bring a whole damn tsunami. <laughs> Um, growing up, I knew that I wasn't the traditional boy. All the coloring books that I was getting were of cars, when all I really wanted to do was color in Ariel's red hair. And so I did after stealing my sister's coloring books. I was learning that the world can be a very limiting place and the small choices start to define you. The subtle act of not acknowledging me because of my queerness slowly turned into jokes and insults. People started asking me, why are you so gay? If I got a dollar for every time someone asked me, why are you so gay? I would be able to afford a house in Auckland. And oh honey, those are expensive. <laughs> Perhaps the reason why young people are so inclined to be prejudiced towards the queer community is because of the negative connotations that society gives it. For example, it is, overwhelmingly common to hear someone refer to something insulting as gay. For example, maths is so gay, or your handwriting is so gay. Now imagine the number of hours I spent in Google trying to find out how someone's handwriting could be homosexual. <laughs> this is such a common form of prejudice that people think is funny, but that does not make it okay. It is disrespectful and hurtful, and people should be made more aware of that it is not okay. When I started high school, new questions were being asked like, when are you coming out? What on God's green crack? I always knew that my sexuality was innate, just as ordinary and annoying as my blackness, but people held these two very natural things to two very different standards. As a brown man, I could marry and have sex with whoever I wanted, but as a gay man, I couldn't. 
people were expecting me to do things as a gay man that they weren't of me as a brown man. For example, I didn't have to come out black. I didn't have to sit my parents down and tell them all about my blackness. As a gay man, everyone always said to me, the Bible says Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. But as a brown man, no one ever said to me, the Bible says Adam and Eve, not Adam and Beyonce. <laughs> so as a brown gay man, I became less of a person. However, as Fijians, we learn that family stays together regardless of it, whether it's positive or toxic. But I remember a year when I was in the good old Auckland Transport, returning from the Pride Parade where I watched a young boy take off his rainbow stickers and brush off his glitter and rub off his rainbow paint because there was no way he could go back to his homophobic household being his authentic self. In that moment, I realized that the social bigotry and the hate towards the queer community had to stop. I searched for gay rights in Fiji there weren't many. In fact, there were laws in place to oppress us. In 2005, an Australian tourist had consensual sex with an adult. Both men were sent to prison for two years under Fiji's sodomy laws. This is a real driver of homophobia, the disgust with homosexual sex, gay sex. The poor or lesbians just get caught up in the homophobic crossfire. <laughs> what they really don't like is sodomy anal sex, buggery, and they assume that's all we do, jumping around in bed, buggering each other all day like we don't have bills to pay. Gay men and women are just as capable of loving and caring, but they are reduced down to this one act, regardless of whether they do it or not. After a lot of fights, in 2010, homosexual acts became legal in Fiji. But it simply was not enough. <laughs> Uh, this year, Prime Minister Frank Benimarama came out and he reiterated his position saying that as long as Fiji First is in government, Fiji will not allow same-sex marriage. Now, homophobic people just won't come out and say, I'm homophobic, oh, I'm disgusted by what they do in the privacy of their own home. So they are forced to look for ridiculous answers like, uh, and the same book that says snakes can talk says homosexuality is a sin, or traditionally marriage was between men and women. That is a lie forced on indigenous people through colonialism. I am my ancestors' wildest dream. After all, I am a decolonizer in a world that forces Pacific people to assimilate from their culture. Our ancestors would be so ashamed to see the way we treat the Vakasa Lewa Lewa and the Vailasami Vakatangane community. They did not stand together through the tortures of colonialism for us to tear each other apart. Stop being a colonizer and start being an it's okay. New Zealand's history for gay rights hasn't been perfect either. In 1840, when New Zealand became a part of the British Empire, it made homosexual acts punishable by death. Let that sink in. It was lawful to kill people for loving. This punishment later changed to life imprisonment, and then finally in 1986, homosexual acts became legal in New Zealand. But this was not about having sex. It was about being able to love openly and freely. It was about being able to do what you want with your body without the government labeling you as a criminal. I'm sure all women can relate. The, the need for love and intimacy is just as fundamental as the need for food, water, and, and air. Gay men could now have sex, but they could not have a family. So in 2013, through Louisa Wall's Members Bill, same-sex marriage was legalized in New Zealand. We would hope that this would change society's attitude towards the queer community, but it did not. I moved away from Fiji, but I'm back in the same position where homophobia is the majority view. After 14 years of knowing who I truly am, I still cannot be that person, because every day I make compromises that take away from who I am. Like I've never casually, comfortably, carelessly held hands with someone I like in public. 
And I make these compromises to the point where I don't even realize I'm doing it. And when I speak out about it, I'm told, can't you just be grateful you don't live in Uganda where they could hang you to death for being gay? I am very grateful that I don't live in Uganda, but this is not a competition for where the most disadvantaged when the complaining rights and everyone else has to either put up or shut up. Whether you like it or not, we live in a homophobic New Zealand. We live in a New Zealand that is infused with homophobia, that is dripping with homophobia. And the sad reality is that your friends turn their back on you, your mother may cry, and your father may get angry. You get tired of putting up with being bullied, beaten, neglected, and disowned. You get tired that America's 9-11 is here 24-7. You get tired that with all this climate crisis, people are investing their time, energy, and money into trying to ban love. I am tired of putting up, so I'm not anymore. I didn't like this thing that I had become that was shameful and joke-worthy. I had to teach myself that gay is not a euphemism for indignity, that my sexuality did not make me any less worthy of safety, comfort, and happiness. We are all afraid of the, the nameless, the faceless, the unknown, and we respond in ways that can be damaging but your son, your colleague, your brother, they all already have a name and face that you know and love. Don't let the reason for their happiness become the reason you choose to hate them. As people, we gravitate towards other people who are like us, or we try to make people like us, and when we fail, we reject them. But every person in this room at one stage in their life will believe in the golden rule that treat others the way you want to be treated. So here's my invitation to you. Treat the queer community like the way you want to be treated. I am queer, I'm here, and I'm not going anywhere. You've had 19 years to make up your mind. You can choose to love me, and real love accepts people as they are. Thank you. <laughs>